Warning, the following video is for entertainment purposes. I am not liable for any actions taken as a result of watching my videos. Walnut blasting is a difficult and invasive process. A mistake could cause catastrophic engine damage. Thoroughly plan and research before attempting. Your results may vary. This is Peep Rushy Racing here and welcome to the channel. Hey everyone, I've been working on and off on this video for the last five months. Thank you so much for your patience. With all the racing I do, I still daily drive the Banana Stallion. It's not easy to keep it in tip-top shape, yet we still manage to go out 30 to 40 days a year. So I simply don't always have the time or energy to put into this YouTube channel. Everything I do is for the promotion of our sport. I would love to do more entertaining videos about grassroots racing. I really appreciate you guys watching, laughing with me, or at me. Please hit that like button and subscribe. It will help me on my goal to monetization, which will help me justify doing more of this kind of content. If you like what I do here, be sure to follow my Facebook and Instagram where I post more regularly. And support the brands that support what I do. So let me be clear. I don't want anybody chasing these horsepower gains, getting themselves into trouble without realizing what this process entails and that you could seriously damage your engine if you make a mistake. That's a lot of damage. If you haven't already watched the previous video outlining walnut blasting, please do so now. This is not a job for a novice mechanic. If you are unsure of your abilities or don't have all the tools and resources, don't try this. Get help, consult a local professional. I watched a lot of videos about walnut blasting before getting into this myself. A lot of people would say that they felt a difference after the cleaning, but I couldn't find any hard data or test results proving this. Honestly, facts don't care about your feelings. So I decided to conduct my own experiment at my own expense and put it out there for the world to see. Science. In my research, I did find a video from CRC about their GDI intake valve and turbo cleaner. It claims to remove carbon from valves, piston heads, fuel injectors, and intake manifolds. I did use this chemical for my cleaning, but only to pre-soak the valves. I feared that if I followed the instructions in the can, that large chunks of carbon could break off and damage the engine. CRC claims this kind of damage cannot happen, that it doesn't break off hard chunks of carbon, instead it tries to dissolve the carbon off of the valves and cylinder heads. CRC was able to show an 85% reduction of carbon deposits on the cylinder head. But that doesn't quite tell the whole story. The chemical treatment on the valves only reduced carbon deposits by 24%. Those valves still look pretty crummy. Now CRC claims if one can doesn't get the job done, just throw another one in there. Oops. We do get some dyno data from CRC. On their 2015 Volkswagen Passat, we were able to see gains of 5.6 horsepower two days after cleaning, and after eight days, a total of 6.9 horsepower was found. Golf clamp. Golf clamp. It's pretty clear that walnut blasting does a much better job. So for my experiment, <laughs> couldn't help but wonder, what would this be worth? 10 horsepower? 15 horsepower. Well, boy, was I in for a surprise. We headed back to our friend Rob at Power Curve Motorsports for another run on the dyno. You ready? Get in. 
Let's remind the viewers, we made 271 wheel horsepower and 300 pound foot of torque dirty. And after the pull, we found a whopping. 22 wheel horsepower. For a grand total of 293 wheel horsepower. That is insane. And we picked that back up just by cleaning the engine. But that's just peak horsepower. On the dyno curve, we noticed differences up to 33 wheel horsepower. That's the power of Not. Now let's take a closer look at that dyno curve. Notice at peak, we picked up that 22 wheel horsepower, but no torque. But the most important thing to look at is the area that we gained under the curve. We see mild gains on the low end from 2,500 to 3,000 RPM. We're dead even as we climb through that mid-range. But at 4,000 RPM, things start to really get interesting. When the engine was dirty, the horsepower and torque began to flatten out. But the clean engine ain't done yet. Keeps on pulling longer and stronger than before. Our biggest gains come just before 5,900 RPM. Where the dirty engine had long fallen off, the clean engine produces a difference of nearly 33 horsepower and 30 foot-pound of torque. Now let's think about how an engine works. Consider your typical four-stroke. For every two revolutions of the crankshaft, the valves have to open and close once. That means at 6,000 RPM, or revolutions per minute, the valves are cycling 3,000 times per minute. That's 50 times per second. In order to ensure optimal fuel and air mixture, engineers designed the valves with a specific profile. We saw that the carbon buildup changes the shape of that valve. And when those valves get moving faster and faster, they won't flow the air as well. Science rules. 22 peak wheel horsepower at 5200 RPM is an 8% gain over the dirty engine. Our 33 wheel horsepower difference at 5,900 RPM is over 10% of the rated crank horsepower. These results are astounding. And it really goes to show a clean engine is a happy engine. If you want to do some mods, you might want to consider basic maintenance, making sure that your engine is running in tip top shape before you go spending your paycheck on speed parts. I need NOS. I need NOS. No. Amateurs don't use nitrous oxide. I've seen the way you drive. You'll blow yourself to pieces. I need one of these. One of the big ones. You know, let's make it two. So where did all of this carbon come from? Every automaker is at the mercy of emissions and fuel economy standards. These are set by unelected bureaucratic government agencies. The OEM can't sell a car unless they prove to the government that the engine burns cleanly and efficiently enough to pass the government tests. Industry experts say that it can cost as much as $6 billion to develop a new car. Every part needs to be engineered to work flawlessly for over a decade, yet be feasible to manufacture on an assembly line. And somehow, the automaker needs to be competitive and turn a profit to stay in business. So with that mountain of pressure, it shouldn't come as a surprise that automakers have made some creative interpretations of rules and regulations. The most infamous offender was Volkswagen. 11 million cars were found to have software that could detect testing conditions and only run emissions equipment while in the lab. You can't do that. Already done. No matter where you fall on the alignment chart, you have to admit, that's pretty clever. They would have gotten away with it too, had it not been for those meddling kids. College kids. So much for those government agencies. Is that, is that my ass? Volkswagen's TDI diesel engines caused the largest scandal in automotive history. This prompted an industry-wide investigation that uncovered that VW wasn't alone in skirting government tests. Oh, bad news. What? The Dacia Sandero. It's delayed. Oh, no. Anyway. So in order to actually pass the tests, cars require complicated emissions systems, catalytic converters, positive crankcase ventilation, 
exhaust gas recirculation, evaporative purge valves, the alphabet soup goes on and on. The automakers have to balance all of this regulatory compliance with the demands of the general public. We as consumers want powerful, efficient engines. More power, baby! More power, baby! There's mixed opinions on cleanliness. But what we can all agree upon is that cars are a major expense. We expect our cars to last a long time and be as reliable as possible. So to appease the government and the consumer, the OEMs make sure their cars can run good enough to pass tests, be powerful and efficient, more power, baby, more power, baby, and somewhat reliable. <laughs> but longevity isn't a main concern. After all, automakers are in the business of selling new cars. They refuse to build cars that last forever. Something on a vehicle will eventually break and render it impractical to be serviced, so you have to go and buy a new vehicle. Here? No, 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 what is this? You said, you said half a car, not half a piece of crap, Dad. <laughs> the government is in on this too, so they only evaluate engines for a useful life. 10 years or 120,000 miles. As long as the engine can run clean enough for the duration of the test, it can be sold to consumers. It doesn't have to be the best, as long as it can pass and last just past the warranty. The automakers made the move to direct injection because all of the fuel goes into the cylinder. Minimal losses helps maximize fuel economy. But despite having the best fuel delivery, direct injection systems are not perfect. Remember all that emissions equipment that we have to have? Well, all that stuff causes trouble throughout the engine. Since engines have to burn cleanly, they can only emit so much unburnt fuel and oil vapors out the tailpipe. That's why we have the positive crankcase ventilation and exhaust gas recirculation. Some dirty air has to remain in the engine, and it gets recycled to try to burn it off in the cylinder so that whatever comes out the tailpipe is acceptable. Huh? <laughs> well, on my turbocharged 2.3 liter EcoBoost, pushing 18 pounds of boost, the emission systems are strained, and they don't work the best. My car is on its third catalytic converter. Luckily, they've all been replaced under warranty. It's had four EVAP purge valves. When we did that walnut blasting, we found an oily mess in the intake manifold, which means that oil vapors are getting blasted at the back of the intake valves. And since the fuel injectors have been moved into the cylinder, there's nothing spraying at that valve to try to keep it clean. So over a long period, the valve will accumulate a hard carbon crust that will alter the shape of the valve. This drastically reduces its ability to flow and mix the air as the engineers intended. And of course, over 100,000 miles, losing 32 horsepower, it's pretty hard to detect. This isn't just a Ford problem. Some engines are worse offenders than others. Many European brands recommend decarbonization at 100,000 miles. Volkswagen Audi Group is notorious for buildup on their GDI engines. Some enthusiasts walnut blast every 30,000 miles. Ford recommends you do nothing to your EcoBoost. Just keep on running it. Looking back at my EcoBoost at 110,000 miles, it was still running fine, despite a few little quirks. Occasional rough idle, backfires, strange puffs on cold start, <coughs> but nothing was severe enough to trigger a check engine light. The ECU parameters have a wide enough window that the engine was still running clean and efficient enough, even if it wasn't making peak power. The horsepower loss was probably not enough of a concern to Ford for them to invest in a better emission system. It passed the test, it passed the warranty period, so it's good to go. But people are discovering the drawbacks of direct injection, and they're not happy with it. Ford EcoBoost engines have gradually been adopting the more effective dual injection systems. 
first with the 3.5, and now we are seeing it trickle down to the 2.3 for the 2024 S650 EcoBoost Mustang. It's great to see that the automakers are acknowledging these issues with direct injection and trying to fix them. But there's a lot of engines out there that will experience this carbon buildup. So do your own homework, look into your engine, see if this is an issue. As stated in the beginning, I take no responsibility for your actions, but I wanted to put this out there that this cleaning could be worth doing if you've got a direct injection engine with over 100,000 miles. So now that we've gone through this tedious and risky cleaning process, what are we going to do to keep this from coming back? Well, tune in next time. We're going to talk about our new UPR dual catch can setup by the time you see this, I'll have put 20,000 miles on the engine since cleaning and since installing this catch can. And we're gonna pull the intake again, see how those valves are looking. Ah, the engine, what a pain in my ass. You could pick up one of these from my sponsor, Function Factory Performance. Head over to ffperformance.co and use code AUTOXPBR to save on your build. Thanks for watching.